There's probably a lot of eaters in the room. Hands up if you eat food. <laughs> anyone, anyone? Any any breatharians here? Yeah, well done. Yes? <laughs> yeah, I'll be out of breath in a minute. Um, what, what role, Ella, do you think eaters, you know, and I'm thinking more sort of urban, urban dwellers who can't necessarily grow their own food, what role do they have in, in the sort of support of um, uh, indigenous foods and that research and that production? I think whether you're rural or, or urban, you can develop a relationship with a plant, whether it's indoor and outdoor, whether it's edible or not edible, and you can start to understand how resilient nature is through that process. Um, but I also think that that, like... Damon said, and to echo what the panel said, is that we need to start being more resourceful. We in Australia and in this region specifically have some of the biggest superfoods in the entire country, yet we are importing things from the Amazon, stealing from other countries and other indigenous people, and then labelling them as health foods. This is crazy, and this is where we need to start to look in our own backyard and understand that the bush foods of this country are what's going to heal us as a nation. So it's an interesting concept, and I totally agree, you know, importing what we can grow here or the, that nutrients or those, um, those beneficial medicinal properties does that mean, potentially, if we were um, to be true to that ideology, would that mean we would be against exporting that to other countries? Is that an, should it be remain an internal medicinal product? I mean, I have a lot to say about the global economic system. You know, I think, first of all, it is something that is contributing to climate change. It is feeding the 1% or the 0.1% and enabling them to have free labour or cheap labour in other countries. And if we can't recognise that this is the continuation of colonisation happening all around the world and that we're contributing to it with our money. And every time we are buying products that aren't local, that are being imported and exported, we are contributing to colonisation. We are contributing to poverty in another country and the destruction of their culture. We're taking away their food systems there. And I think we need to redefine what it is to be a privileged country and have all of these things on offer when really we need to narrow it down and start to look in our own backyard. And I personally think that means we should, you know, halt the import and exploitation of things that is, you know, quite clearly crazy because, you know, if anybody knows Helen and Norbert Hodges' work, she talks about importing and exporting. We're importing and exporting the same amount of beef, bottled water, you know. This is just carbon emissions being flown all around the world for what reason but to make the rich richer. Um, the environment is definitely subsidising our lifestyle, isn't it? At great expense. Uh, Bruce, um, we're coming to the end of our little panel session. Have you enjoyed it? Oh, well, it's a... Can you finish it off? Any parting little comments? No, I don't think we should finish it off. I think we should continue it um, in our lives. But, you know, it's, um, it's fantastic to hear these thoughts spoken by young Aboriginal woman um, and, um, uh, and to hear Damon talk so eloquently about soil and about in, you know, our interaction with it. So it's been a hell of a good time for me. I've, in, I've enjoyed myself and um, uh, I don't think we should finish the conversation. I don't think if we finish the conversation then we've caved into the self-interest of globalisation. I was going to say that um, when I was a kid we used to uh, eat cherries in the cherry season, strawberries in the strawberry season and apples in the apple season. Um, and we didn't, um, when we wanted to love our mother, we didn't import the flowers from Malaysia. Um, the, these are crazy things. We are, in my country, we are allowing the trees to be torn down, turned into pulp, shipped through the barrier reef to Japan and we buy them back as hamburger wrappers 
It's unsustainable. It's stupid. Ask the eight-year-old. Ask the eight-year-old if that's going to work for too long and, and they'll say, um, why don't we make our own paper? Bruce, one last question. Well, not, well, not the last. The last question for this panel session because there's so many more. What, how, what would you suggest to those here today and those on the, on the live stream and the world? How can we, what are some ways we can continue this conversation? When we leave here, we've said goodbye to our buddies and we go home, talk to our kids, go to work on Monday. I think we, we have to not talk amongst ourselves because we're all going to agree. Um, we have to pick the hardest target um, and talk, you know, if Tony Abbott's your neighbour, then this is, um, I feel for you, but really, if Tony Abbott uh, or Barnaby Joyce is your neighbour, talk to them. Talk to them and wear them down. If they don't change their mind, don't be surprised, uh, but don't give them a chance not to have to consider your opinion. I mean, but express that op opinion lovingly. You know, they're, they're just people and we, we tend to treat them as if they're gods and um, they're, they're just people and they can change their minds and we've seen evidence of it. We've seen evidence of people changing their minds and doing a complete about turn. So we have to talk to those people who we don't think are going to agree with us. Um, and, and we have to become resilient to failure. Um, to the fact that we're not going to get this agreement that we want, but we're going to uh, speak to enough people, put the argument as coherently as, and lovingly as we can, and we will have some success and we'll change the world. And it's a generational thing too. I think the generations to come are far more generous than mine. Thank you, Bruce.